Welcome to Beyond Bite Wings, the business side of dentistry, brought to you by Edwards & Associates PC. Join us as we discuss how to build your dental practice, optimize your income, and plan for your future. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Edwards & Associates PC is not rendering legal, accounting, or professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information that is shared. At Edwards & Associates PC, our business is the business of dentistry. For help or more information, visit our website at enassociates.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Beyond Bite Wings. In today's episode, we will be talking about DSOs. What are we going to say about DSOs today? That's a good question, Robert. But before we actually start talking about DSOs, can you tell our audience and our listeners what exactly DSO stands for? Dental Service Organization. But to our a lot of our clients and a lot of dentists, it stands for more money than I can imagine for my, <laughs> for my practice. So I think a lot of the, the factor that drives the the, what's the word? The, the desire to sell to a lot of the DSOs today is based on greed. Mm. If you have a true entrepreneur dentist, then they wouldn't sell to corporate dentistry. But if you have somebody that wants to get as much money as they possibly can for their practice, they're going to go looking for a buyer that's related in some way to a DSO. Corporate dentistry, private equity, uh, whatever you call them. Mm. Uh, it all boils down to the large uh, group practices. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you think a DSO is able to offer much more money than, let's say, a separate independent buyer? Well, I think it's because of the way they value the practices. Mm-hmm. Uh, they value them on a multiple of EBITDA. Mm-hmm. That's E-B-I-T-D-A, I believe, mm-hmm. if I got that right. Mm-hmm. Earnings before income taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And it's basically an adjusted net income number. And they buy practices for a multiple of that instead of a fraction of collections, which is historically the way you value a practice. And that's an oversimplification. But basically, uh, practices have been known to sell for somewhere between 65 and 70 or 75 percent of trailing 12 months collections historically. Mm -hmm. But a DSO will come in and look at adjusted net income or EBITDA, Mm -hmm. and they'll pay a multiple of that for it. And multiples vary anywhere from three to over 10. Wow. So you might ask what determines the multiple that they're going to pay for my practice. And it really depends on your practice. It depends on how long your practice has been around, how stable your staff is, the pay rates of your staff, the collections of your practice, the net income of your practice, because they're looking more at the net income. Because the way this all came about was private equity determined that they could earn a given return by uh, paying a certain multiple for dental practices once they learned how to get into the service industry. And that multiple is really um, what it takes them to earn 12% on their money, 12 or 13% on their money. That's all they're looking for. A dentist typically earns a third of what he collects, but private equity is willing to settle for substantially less, you know, around 12%. Hmm. So that's, once you do the multiple, it's just a math calculation. It, it enables the price to be so much higher for them to get that 12% earnings. I see. And so they're they're paying way more for these practices than historically an entrepreneur or doctor would pay for one. I see. And is there anything that's different about selling to a DSO as opposed to an independent buyer? I'm, I'm basically talking about What happens after the sale? Let's say the owner doctor used to actually practice the practice that he or she is planning on selling. Do they continue practicing or do they stop practicing? Or if if they do decide to practice, how long do they typically practice for, let's say, an independent buyer as opposed to a DSO? Well, if they sell their practice to another entrepreneur, dentist, an independent buyer, then basically they're going to stick around during the transition period. And the transition period for a sale from peer-to-peer is going to be somewhere around maybe four months, maybe six months. Now, I've seen one that was as long as eight years because the seller yeah. said, I'm, oh, I still want to work here uh, until my youngest child graduates from college. Wow. And they were just starting high school. Oh. 
Uh-huh. So the buyer of that practice, and it was a large practice, and it would support both doctors. Most practices won't support two doctors, so when one sells, he's got to kind of step aside after a, a period. And, and usually we'll put in a contract a transition period of four to six months. Mm. But generally by the end of the second month, the buyer doesn't want the the, the seller around anymore. He's going to say, <laughs> hey, you know, go on, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> go do something else. And so uh, that generally it's four to six months. Now that that's in a sale of peer to peer. But if you have a dentist, individual dentist selling to corporate or to group dentistry, the, they're going to want the seller to stay around for minimum of three years, sometimes as long as five years. And what they do to ensure that is they will quote you a very large price for your practice. As we talked about a multiple of EBITDA mm-hmm. And they're going to have uh, a very little amount of that, maybe less than 50% of that paid up front sometimes, not every time, but sometimes. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to stick around the five years to earn out the other 100% or the other 50% of the sale price. So it's kind of dangling a carrot there. You leave after three years, then you're leaving money on the table. You know, you leave immediately, you're leaving 50% of the money on the table. So they may offer you you know, double what you would get in a peer-to-peer sale, but you only get maybe as little as half of it up front and the rest of it earned out over five years. Ah, and these proceeds from sales, these are on top of the salary that they would continue to make after the sale. Uh, that's correct. Once you sell the practice, then you are basically an associate doctor and they're going to pay you a percentage of your production, usually uh, 30, 35%, maybe in some cases of specialist, 40%. Oh, uh, wow. of, re- okay. of your production. Okay. Now, a lot of times what happens in a sale is uh, you, you ask me how, you know, what, how's the practice run? Well, I've had clients come to me and, and, and say, look, I want to sell my practice because all I really want to do is see patients. I don't want to deal with uh, staffing issues, marketing, you know, patients. Basically, I just want to treat the patients that are here. I don't want to have to run the business. I and I hear that every day from from clients of ours. But I think it because of the pandemic, it seems to have magnified the, the problems, especially the staffing problems. Mm-hmm. Everybody's having problems with uh, getting enough staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and patients are canceling left and right at this point in time just because of, of the pandemic and, and mm-hmm. the different uh, waves of the variants. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we it ebbs and flows, but it, right now it seems to be at a, a high, and mm-hmm. so there's a lot of cancellations. Uh, there's not a lot of people in the practices that are sick, but there's a lot of patients that have canceled due to someone in their family being sick. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so the doctors are fed up with that, and they're saying, you know, I just, I just want to see the patients. I don't want to have to worry about the business. I mean, if we all shut down, am I going to have to file bankruptcy? Is the government going to bail us out again? Those are all, you know, great questions. So they put that burden on the corporate, on the corporate mm-hmm. dentistry, mm-hmm. Uh, on the DSO. They say, okay, you know, these are your problems now. And, and the DSOs are saying, basically, you know, we can deal with that, but we need you to, to do the dentistry. Mm-hmm. And uh, depends on the, the DSOs. There's really at least two types of DSOs. One is doctor-owned, mm-hmm. and the other is private equity-owned. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of uh, bad reputation around. I don't know if it's deserved or not. But there's a lot of bad reputation of some of the, the private equity DSOs telling the doctors or giving them quotas on how many crowns they need to do or how much they need to produce in a certain day. Now, if you're an entrepreneur dentist and you own your own practice, you should still have a goal of how much you're going to produce each day. Mm-hmm. You know, But for an accountant that's working for a DSO, it comes in and says, okay, your, your production uh, for this hour needs to be this amount. And if you think they don't measure it by hour, you're crazy. They do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I talked to one, I guess it was a couple of the guys uh, in, in acquisitions for a DSO. They said they have a dashboard monitor where they monitor the doctor's production by hour by operatory. Oh, wow. And they said if it drops below a certain amount, they get in the car and they drive out there and they talk to the doctor. Why did it drop below this level? What can we do to get it back up? And they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're that much hands on. That's really micromanaging. Mm-hmm. But again, they would probably say we're one of the more successful DSOs out here because of our hands on approach. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think a lot of doctors resent that kind of uh, oversight right, looking right. over their shoulder. Now, that particular DSO was, was mostly run by other doctors. 
So it, it's it's not as bad as it would be if it were you know some accountant coming out there and telling you that you should be producing this amount every day or every right. hour. Right. Oh wow, that's great. But you do lose some control. You lose some control sometimes over the materials you're using. Right. The DSO, DSOs are going to order wherever they can get the best deal, maybe mm-hmm. to cut cost. Mm-hmm. Um, on the flip side, uh, some of the staff that work for DSOs have told me that the benefits are better. Mm-hmm. Because the DSOs uh, offer, you know, health insurance. They offer sometimes student loan repayment up to a certain amount. Uh, they'll offer sometimes signing bonuses. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll do things that individual doctors don't have the money to do. They'll do a lot of marketing. You know, they'll do a lot of incentives for the staff, maybe a bonus program, uh, as well as a retirement plan. And a lot of individual entrepreneur doctors don't have that those benefits in place for their employees. No, now, it's becoming a lot more common over the last few years uh, to include some of those benefits, but still, sometimes the individual doctors can't afford that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you actually raise a good point. So, uh, talking about the staff, and that's also another concern that I've heard from people that are potentially planning on selling to a DSO, is if I do sell to a DSO, can I still keep my existing staff, or are they going to get replaced? And... Every deal that I've seen mm-hmm. where the transaction has taken place, the DSO will tell you that you can keep your staff. Okay. Now, it's like any transition. If you have a peer-to-peer sale, you know the bank that finances it for the buyer doesn't want to see, uh, or they do want to see, as few changes as possible. So, yeah, keep your staff. But the reality of the situation is the DSO is going to come in there, and if they need to make changes, they will. And they're not going to ask you first if, you know, we need, if, if you agree with what they're about to do. So if you have staff that's, that's grossly overpaid, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I know we have a client who overpays her staff because she uh, doesn't have a bonus system, but so she just pays them a higher salary mm-hmm. and she expects their loyalty for that. She expects that they're not going to leave for another job because they can't earn as much somewhere else. Now, that's a rare situation, but in a situation like that, if a DSO bought her practice, I'm sure that they would cut salaries. Mm -hmm. And for those that didn't like that attitude, uh, they could leave because it's a corporation. You're no longer dealing with an individual face-to-face. You're dealing with a corporate entity, and they're going to do whatever it takes to make the profits whatever they need to be in their view, in their opinion. But that's not to say that uh, if you are considering selling to a DSO, that that's always the wrong move. No, it's not. You will get more money selling your practice to a DSO than you would selling it to another individual doctor. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's a fact of life. Right, 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 right. And regarding even the dental supplies or the equipment that they use, um, if it is cost effective, maybe a little better quality than the cheapest ones that are out there, the DSO is willing to work with you because they understand that the quality of these supplies will uh, impact the quality of your service. Uh, You would think so. And in most cases, I'm sure that's true. But I have, again, with one of our clients, I've seen a case where they quit buying supplies domestically and they started going overseas for supplies. And, of course, the doctor, the seller that's Mm -hmm. still there now as the associate doctor doesn't care for that. And I don't think, uh, according to her, her patients also didn't care for that. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it can damage the the reputation of the practice because, you know, as the, the doctor running the practice... You've built a reputation for that practice, mm-hmm. not for yourself, but yeah, for yourself, sure, but mm-hmm. but for the practice. It has a reputation of you know doing things a certain way, and if patients have been coming there for a number of years, they know that, and they know what to expect, and then all of a sudden, you know, they're getting toothbrushes instead of from, uh, you know, South Carolina, they're coming from China right, or Vietnam, <laughs> you know, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what they're expecting, so they're seeing change. Okay. So, yeah, the people are still the same, but all of a sudden they're seeing a change in materials. And, mm-hmm. and so then you start thinking, if, if these things are changing, then are the materials that are going in my mouth, are, are those changing as well? And if they ask the question, then the doctor's obligated to tell them the truth. Uh, yeah, we're no longer buying that from here. We're buying it from there. Mm-hmm. And people may tend to, to, to react negatively to that. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of concerns. Um, about a lot of the DSOs acquiring these practices, and and you just don't know how it's going to shake out until we're down the road, maybe right. two to three years. Right. I see. And the DSOs will all tell, always tell you, yeah, nothing's going to change. You still you're running the practice. 
okay, but it's their money now. Mm. And uh, if they need to make a change, they will. I'm sure in some cases, I can't recall a specific instance where I've seen this happen, but in some cases, uh, you know, a doctor may actually uh, be making too much. And so the DSO will, you know, cut their pay. And if they want to leave, you know, that's fine because they can always find a doctor to replace them. Again, it, it, it's the unemotional corporate entity that's running the practice now when I you see. have a DSO. I see. But if the doctors are getting paid a percentage of whatever they're producing, can they, and if it's part of the contract, can they still cut their pay? Uh, they could maybe not cut their pay, but there's other ways to, to, I guess, what's the word, to force them some to concede some. Oh, I see. So like reduce their overall take home. They, they could make the uh, working conditions to a degree where they wouldn't want to, to continue to be associated with the practice and, you know, and maybe. I see. But yeah. that's a rare instance, though. It is. And it, it, I mean. And I haven't seen any specific, specifically like that uh, that have happened. I've heard doctors talk about it, uh -huh. but I don't have firsthand knowledge of that. I see. So there are basically pros and cons to this. Yeah. yeah. And I think DSOs have a bad rep mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of the doctors. Mm -hmm. But I also tell you that uh, I've never seen so many docs that are looking for a DSO to buy their practice because, uh, again, the greed factor. How much can I get for my practice? Right. And, you know, my question for, a you know, a 40-year-old doctor, if he's selling his practice to a DSO, okay, that's good. Now what are you going to do next? Right. And if they're going to go start another practice outside of their non-compete, great. If they're going to continue to work for the DSO for a number of years, you know, great. You know, but what are their plans? Because I don't want people to, to sell their practice to a DSO with blinders on and, and they're not thinking about what they're going to do the next you know, the next day after they close, what are they going to do next? Now, again, most DSOs want the doctors to stay on. But as we've seen in our practice, uh, we have several doctors that have sold to DSOs and, and changed careers. Wow. So they're not available to, to continue to work for the DSO going down the road. I see. That's something else I've seen a whole lot more of since the pandemic started. I see. Not just hygienists leaving dentistry, but some of the doctors leaving dentistry. Wow. Yeah, I can think of a couple that uh, just took a whole different route. In fact, it's a very popular route in the real estate. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, now, in your professional opinion, uh, I mean, we, we hear a lot of clients that are getting offers from DSOs, these lucrative offers. They are seriously considering it. But when they approach you and ask you, hey, Robert, you know, uh, what do you think? Should I pull the trigger? Should I go ahead or should I hold off till later? What do you usually tell them right now in the current market? That's a, it's a great question. And I think I can give you a couple of examples and sort of you can understand then kind of what our advice is. If a doctor is close to retirement, mm -hmm. maybe within two to three years, then he'll probably benefit from selling to the DSO, working his, the remaining two or three years in his career and then retiring. On the other hand, if you've got a doctor that's, let's say, 15 years from retirement, uh, and this is an actual instance that I've been involved in, once the DSO bought his practice, his income was going to be half of what it was before based on his production because it was no longer based on the profits of the practice. It's now based on just his individual production. Mm -hmm. And so he's 15 years from retirement. He's going to get this lump sum for the practice, but his income is going to be half of what it was. So is he really coming out ahead? Because how many people can live on half of what they were making prior to selling? He's going to have to dip into that big pile of money he got for the practice to supplement his income to maintain his lifestyle. So at the end of the 15 years, he would actually have less than he would have if he had waited and sold to just a, another entrepreneurial doctor. So it depends on really. Now, from what I said there, you may think the closer to retirement you are, the better it might work selling to a DSO. Uh, but again, you have some people that are leaving dentistry and they just want to, you know, to change careers. So that's probably a good time to sell. Uh, and if you're going to sell and leave dentistry, then get as much as you can for the practice. You know, if you, if you don't want to deal with running a business anymore, if you just want to be an associate doctor. Uh, and I think more dentists are getting used to just being associates. There's more, obviously more than recent graduates that are working in corporate dentistry these days. And and they're making so much, they're being paid so much that they don't have any desire to go open their own practice. Mm -hmm. I had a doctor today that was, said he's making around 250000 a year working for you know, another corporate dentistry. 
and he's thinking about buying a practice. And he asked me, he said, if I buy this practice for X number of dollars, do you think I can make $300,000 next year? And I, well, he didn't say next year. He said, do you think I can make $300,000? And I said, well, that's not the right question. If you had said next year, I would have said, hell no. <laughs> in two years, possibly. In three years, yeah. You know, if you do everything right, in three years, you can be at that level. But no, you're not going to make that in the first year. It's going to be a step back. Uh, I've had clients come to me or prospects come to me talking about starting their own practice and, and working in corporate dentistry. And up on a few questions, I find out they're making 300000 now. And, and if they start their own practice, they think they can make that, you know, initially from a scratch start practice. Oh, goodness. And, and you know, they re- unrealistic expectations. Mm-hmm. So once they understand that you're not going to make that kind of money right away, then they're sort of trapped in corporate dentistry. They're there because of the money they're being paid. Right. They're not there because they enjoy it. They're not there because they have any control over their career. They certainly aren't creating an asset that they can sell later. That's the corporate. Corporate, that's theirs. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're sort of trapped into that, especially if they have a family and a house and car payments, maybe college if they're mm-hmm. that far along. Uh, so they're, they're trapped in that corporate environment. They can't go out and start their own practice or purchase an existing practice to move on and build an asset with. So there's a lot of different reasons to sell. There's a lot of different times to sell. I think they're better off if you're closer to retirement. As a rule of thumb, uh, that's probably the time to seriously consider an offer from a DSO. Okay. So those are some great tips. And uh, just one last question before we end this episode. Do you think this DSO offers, this gravy boat, will be there for some time? Or do you think it's not going to be long-lived? Well, you know, I love the way people ask questions. So do I believe it's going to be there for some time? Yeah, I do. Okay. The question is, how long? (laughs) You know, two years ago, three years ago, even four years ago, corporate dentistry, the DSOs and all the the big um, conferences they have, and I would attend some of those, and they said, yeah, this this gravy train, if you will, is probably going to be around for another five to seven years. Then we had the pandemic, and it slowed down acquisitions, and now they're going, again, great guns, but they're trying to make up for lost time. Uh So I talk to people at the DSOs now, and I look at the environment, and I see some of these conferences online, and what they're saying now is, yeah, I think this will still be going on for another five to seven years. So I think it's still maybe another five to seven years. In fact, I had that conversation with a client earlier this week. I said, you know, just continue to build the practice. And then in maybe three years, we look at possibly selling it. Right. In the meantime, we monitor where the environment is, where the DSO thing is going. Right. And, uh, you know, anyway, you just kind of monitor it and see what's happening in, in the dental environment. And there'll be a time to pull the trigger, but it's not necessarily today. I see. Okay. Great. No, thank you so much, Robert, for sharing all that information with us. And if any of our listeners have any questions about, you know, DSOs or should I consider selling to a DSO, those are questions I deal with literally virtually every single day now. And I'm analyzing those situations for not just clients of ours, but anybody that calls in. If anybody would like some advice, tell them how to get in touch with us. Oh, absolutely. Feel free to reach us at info at eandassociates.com. And the and is spelled out A-N-D. Uh, We look forward to hearing from you guys and have a great day. Thanks for listening today. Be sure to subscribe to Beyond Bite Wings on your favorite podcast platform. For more info, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, or reach out to us on our website. You can also shoot us an email at info at eandassociates.com.